Today's episode is a little bit different. It is pulled from the Patreon vaults that were once totally exclusive, but this episode is really important. So I'm pulling it out and it's the first ever one of these talks to be seen on our normal channel. It is all about how Delta Blues, Clarkstone, Mississippi, influenced the world and created music as we know it. It's a really important talk. Myself, Nick, and Addison traveled from Memphis to Clarksdale, Mississippi, down Highway 61, and I'm gonna walk you through some key geographical points and kind of share a narrative that I feel is really vital to loving and understanding music in a really beautiful way. Today's video is a walk down Highway 61, so it's a really quick day trip. And uh, we're starting here in Memphis, Tennessee. We just got off the airplane, and behind me is Sun Studios. So Sun Studios is really vital in the story I'm gonna teach you today because it involves a man named Sam Phillips. Sam Phillips started the Memphis Recording Service in 1950, and in 1951, while doing that, he recorded Ike Turner and a song called Rocket 88. Rocket 88, I've mentioned on several episodes, is one of, if not the first account of rock and roll recorded. Uh, there's a distorted guitar in that track. It's a mix of rhythm and blues and some of the things from the Delta, which we'll head to later, where Ike was from. But on their way here, they pull a guitar amp out of the car to fix a flat and they break something in that amp. When they bring it here, Sam, shoves some paper into the amp around the speaker cone to fix that broken speaker and the sound was great he liked it he kept it and that song became a huge hit in 1951 and a year later because of that being a hit he had the funds to make his own brand new studio he called it sun that's what's behind us here so that's where we're going to start and then in that timeline, one year later in 1953, Elvis Presley records here. And it is literally one of those things where the rest is history. So Sam Phillips is a big deal. What happened here is a big deal. And this starts a journey that we'll take today from Memphis down into the Delta, Clarksdale, Mississippi. The Delta is about a 200 mile range of land that kind of starts in Memphis and goes all down through this certain section of Mississippi. Uh, that's it. We're here at Sun and we're gonna get on the road and go to Clarksdale. Action everybody. We have left Memphis and we are on Highway 61. So Highway 61 starts at the Mississippi State Line just south of Memphis and we're driving towards Clarksdale. So to start off this whole talk um, and kind of give context to the reason I wanted to film a little day tour of this trip. I'm gonna use Bob Dylan's Highway 61 revisited album um, as an explanation to why this area is so important. So Dylan is a folk singer and before 1965, he plays acoustic guitar, he covers blues artists, he's listening to guys like Robert Johnson or Woody Guthrie, all these original American folk artists. And in 1965, he makes a pretty big leap when he releases um, in March, bringing it all back home. The A side is electric and the B side of that record is acoustic. But there's a song called Maggie's Farm and the reference of Maggie's Farm is kind of the folk industry and folk music as a whole, he was getting tired of it. And he says, I'm not gonna work on Maggie's farm no more. And that whole A side of that record offended most of his fans and most of his audience. So that album comes out in March. In July, he plays the Newport Folk Festival and he appears on stage at this sacred event where he has been the spokesperson and kind of messiah of American folk music in a black leather jacket and a Fender Stratocaster. And his band is incredibly loud. He has Mike Bloomfield on the guitar. And the story goes that everyone was booing, people were yelling. 
Uh, one of the event coordinators threatened to take an ax and cut the power cable to the stage. It was like incredibly offensive. Uh, people threw stuff at the stage as well. And some people did enjoy it. But when we look back over history, that moment is significant because Bob Dylan basically kind of stuck a middle finger to the folk industry and said, this is now folk music. Folk became rock in July of 1965 at the Newport Folk Festival when the spokesperson for folk strapped on a Stratocaster and turned folk music, blues music, um, into rock music. And then he followed it up in August. So all this is 65, so Dylan was a busy man, but he released one of my favorite albums ever, probably in my top five. Um, he released an album called Highway 61 Revisited in August of 1965. And Highway 61 Revisited was his follow-up to Maggie's Farm, Bring It All Back Home, doing that at the Newport Folk Festival. And then he releases a fully electrified album that was him basically never looking back at the folk singer he had been. And it was all pointing to this highway we're driving down. So we started in Memphis at Sun Records where these amazing early rock and roll um, artists performed and recorded, early blues artists, like even at Sun, Howlin' Wolf, guys like that. These were Dylan's idols. Like Dylan loved Elvis. He loved Howlin' Wolf. He loved the people that started in Memphis. And in this album, he's saying, let's revisit American folk music. And we're gonna do it with electric guitars. So this is a massive, massive moment in music. And a lot of musicologists and historians will say that is when the 1960s began. Like as far as a counterculture that we all see. We see 1960s in our head as hippies walking around in purple outfits with afros and acid and LSD. Um, the early 60s was pretty tame, but after Dylan did that at Newport and released Highway 61, it was a totally different atmosphere and the world changed forever. So that album by Rolling Stone, Highway 61 Revisited, was ranked number 18 of all time, um, which is pretty baller. Like I said, he was mocking basically folk music. He was saying history is changing, things are changing, music is changing, and all of you have to change, so I'm gonna go ahead and change. He was kind of a spokesperson for, let's, let's move on from this folky thing with acoustic guitars, and let's bring it into this new era. Um, the reason Highway 61, like I said, is so important is the massive amount of artists that, that Dylan is referring back to. So I'm gonna read a list of just names. This is not even touching the tip of how many people originated from the section of highway through the Mississippi Delta. So Muddy Waters, Sunhouse, Elvis Presley, Charlie Patton, Ike Turner, the first ever rock and roll song recorded, B.B. Um, King, Robert Johnson, Howlin' Wolf, Sam Cooke, Jimmy Reed, like I could go on and on and on. Rock music as we know it originated here and became what we know of it after Dylan and other people decided to electrify it. Go listen to Highway 61, hit pause, listen to that record. If you already know it, view it in the hindsight of a folk singer wanting to change music, point it back to folk, but also electrify it. And that is why that album's so important and why this highway is so important. So you could almost call today's episode revisiting Highway 61 Revisited or something corny like that. I don't know. It's important to understand that the term blues music is a commercialized definition of a form of music to sell to a certain crowd. So blues music has always just been, hey, this is a type of music that we think white people might enjoy, that we're gonna pull from the Delta, these black artists, these black musicians, and, and for all intents and purposes, and even in quotations and writings and books you can read, white people from the North were pulling black music out of the Delta because it was exotic and interesting and they defined it as blues, when really it was just the folk music of the South. And so as, you know, for me, a, a white guy, almost 40 years old in 2020, when I hear the term blues, I tend to think of like 
Stevie Ray Vaughan or not really what the blues was at this period. When we listen to Robert Johnson and Muddy Waters, um, that's just folk music. It was, it was a standardized form of music from a group of people in a region that represented a culture. And it got commercialized and defined by white people as blues music. But it wasn't so clean cut. If you listen to the 29 tracks of Robert Johnson's recordings, which I'll get into that later, um, he's a huge player in this narrative of how this all evolved. He's the first ever rock star and all these people are influenced by his recordings. He isn't clean cut. He's playing stuff that sounds like it could be on the French Quarter in New Orleans. It could be played in Chicago. It could be played in Memphis. It was really broad. Uh, he wasn't a blues artist. He was a folk artist and that's, that's why that's important. And back to the Dylan thing, that's why it meant so much to Dylan. These were the original folk artists. And to say blues music was a black guy singing about hard times, that's, that comes from the 60s. That wasn't even a thought that crossed anyone's mind to define that as blues until white people and British white people like Eric Clapton, Keith Richards, Mick Jagger started referring to it in that way. So that's what the blues music is. It's really folk music onto another thing. We are about 10 minutes away from Clarksdale and um, it's important to talk about this. I mentioned it at Sun, how Ike Turner from Clarksdale had a band and they practiced at a hotel we'll go to and Sam Phillips at Sun said, hey, come record a song. So they put together this song called Rocket 88, which was a variation on another song they had heard and they changed the words basically. But they're driving this highway just like we are now uh, in whatever form or wherever that exact original 61 was. This is a four lane now, but in that day, it was a two lane, very small highway. And this would have been 1951. And they pulled over because they had a flat they just rehearsed, they jump in the car from Clarksdale to drive an hour and a half-ish to Memphis to see Sam Phillips to track this song and get famous, basically. That's what all of them wanted to do. They are changing a flat and to get to the spare tire, they have to remove gear from the car and they pull the amplifier out and apparently it's dropped, it's damaged, it's become a little bit of folklore what actually happened. But when they get to Sun, Sam Phillips is standing there, they plug the guitar in, it's really raspy and dirty. They've destroyed or damaged the speaker and Sam Phillips takes a wad of paper, newspaper or something, shoves it into the back of the amp to hold the speaker cone there and it distorts. So this song Rocket 88, um, it's the first ever really distorted guitar we hear in the context of rhythm and blues, blues music, rock music, this new thing that's happening. And so in 1951, changing a flat created permission to distort your guitar. Now, another interesting thing is that Sam Phillips was bringing in these blues artists like Howling Wolf particularly. Um, and we hear on uh, how many more times this distorted electric guitar. Um, so Sam was familiar with recording distorted electric which at the time was not permitted, but he liked it and he kept putting it on recording. So when Ike Turner's band shows up with a broken amp, he just shoves a uh, paper in and he likes how it sounds. So this moment is really important. It gives permission to people to turn a guitar up and distort a guitar in a way that had never been happened. So that's a big deal. And thank you Highway 61 for flatting the tire of a band on the way to Memphis, I guess. Can you think a highway, is that possible? Yes. Yeah, you can think of highway and we just did. One thing that needs defining for a lot of people and for myself it was very important to understand what the Delta is. We hear King of the Delta Blues. That was Robert Johnson's recordings that were released in 1961, almost 30 years after uh, he had actually recorded them and he had already passed away. But Delta Blues, what is that? We hear Delta Blues, Mississippi Delta. So that Delta is this span of about 200 miles south of Memphis, and it is where the Mississippi River overflows 
onto flat land and makes the soil really rich. And this is important because it was kind of discovered in the 1800s as a great place to plant crops. Now, it wasn't historically like a slave area. There weren't plantations here. There weren't slaves like growing up here generation after generation. And in a lot of people's minds, all of these Delta blues artists were like basically slaves making music and being recorded. But that's not the narrative. The narrative is that the Delta became a place where these poor families, these black families from all over would travel into with the promise of having really good jobs. So it was a place that really no one was from here. They all traveled in and they sharecropped, they did all those things and it built these communities like Clarksdale, Greenville, Tunica, all of these artists here, um, they wanted to move on. This was like a middle ground for getting out of the South. A lot of people, primarily you hear it in the stories of Muddy Waters, you hear it in Robert Johnson singing Sweet Home Chicago and writing that song. He wasn't saying Sweet Home Delta. He wanted to get out of the Delta and everyone here wanted to move on. That's super important because in our minds, there's this race thing that goes on. When everyone discovers these blues artists in the 60s, they have this image in their head that they're listening to slaves coming in from work, sitting on their porch, playing their guitar. But really, it was a migrant community of different little pockets of the South gathering in the Delta. And it was a really vast musical kind of playground of sorts. Everyone was learning from each other. This person from uh, Louisiana would meet this person from Mississippi and this person from Florida. And it became this community of really thriving music, which helps us understand how in the world do all these musicians come from here. Now, a big piece of how we know about the Delta Blues comes from Alan Lomax and different people doing field recordings. So basically, the Library of Congress started coming down and recording artists um, as a cultural thing to kind of investigate culture, document culture. So the Delta is a middle ground, this big, huge community, migrant people joining together, creating music, working in fields and stuff, but moving on to places like Chicago. So that's what the Delta is. And it is definitely like the seed of rock and roll. Uh, and even everything like we listen to Led Zeppelin one and say that's the first form of metal. Well, that all started here because Jimmy Page and Robert Plant were obsessed with Delta blues artists. So in a weird way, all these people coming together to this fertile soil for new jobs, for a chance to go further north to Chicago, they created this musical subculture of folk music that forever changed the music afterwards. That's the Delta. I rambled a little bit, but you'll just have to deal with it. We are at the intersection of 49 and 61, and this is The Crossroads. So most of you have heard of The Crossroads from Cream, Eric Clapton, covering it live on one of their records. I went down to The Crossroads, fell down on my knees, asked a little bit for mercy. Uh, that is this exact point of location. So Robert Johnson was born in 1911, I believe, and uh, he got into guitar. One of the first things he ever did, there's a legend about, I don't think it's legend, I think a family member states, he actually nailed wire to the side of a house and would pluck one string. He was fascinated with guitar because guitar was becoming a primary instrument of the folk music around here and all the people he grew up around were playing it. He eventually got a three string guitar, then he got a really beat up six string guitar, it's told, and he wasn't that good. And a local blues legend that some of you may have heard of, his name is Sun House, he played around here. And he, he said that he remembers Robert as a young teenager coming to the juke joints and he was okay on harmonica, but when he picked up a guitar, it was kind of like, ugh, get him off the guitar. Robert would actually go in while they were out taking smoke breaks or whatever and start playing and he would run people off. He said he was horrible. Well, Sun House says that six months or so, Robert disappears. 
and uh, he would have been 19, 20 years old, I guess, uh, maybe a little older. I'm not sure the exact timeline, but he came back and it was jaw dropping. His voice was amazing. He was doing things on the guitar that no one had done. He was picking bass notes, treble notes, playing rhythm and lead. And the legend basically came to be that he was told to come down near a plantation at this intersection and to be here at the stroke of midnight. And basically the myth is that the devil met him, took his guitar, played some chords, handed it back. And at that moment, Robert Johnson was a blues icon, superhero, a uh, rock star. And that explains how in the world this untalented person became so amazing. And in hindsight, looking back from the 60s, British invasion artist, early rock blues artist that he was so influential on, how did that happen? How did someone with no talent end up becoming literally the first guitar superstar? It's wild because he only tracked 29 songs he had a career just a few years long. As he died, no one even knew he'd passed away. I'll get into that on the car ride out of here, but this is where it supposedly happened. The urban legend or the answer to the troubling question of how in the world did he get so good? Well, he came here at midnight and he met the devil. So we might want to get in the car before the devil arrives. So uh, let's move on. now back on the highway and uh, yeah leaving the crossroads area so I'm gonna talk a bit about his career after this supposed crossroad event and I want to read um, the optional more likely story of what happened to him Sun House uh, was quoted in confirming the uh, myth that he met the devil at the crossroads at midnight and I think it's a great story, and we all love really great stories, but the more realistic take on this is he wasn't gone for six months. Uh, a lot of people and a lot of musicologists and researchers do interviews with family, said it would have been more like two years. He traveled around and he kind of became a drifter or someone, you know, a musician you would see traveling around the juke joints all over the Delta and even up into Memphis and possibly outside of that into Arkansas. Uh, Steven Johnson, his grandson, tells the story that most people say is very, very, very likely. He says, um, Robert Johnson went to Hazelhurst in search of his biological father. Um, along the way, he ran into Ike Zimmerman, who was a blues player, uh, took him in his family and taught him everything he knew. And this would have taken a few years. Uh, one ironic and strange part of this story is that apparently Zimmerman would take him out to a cemetery and he would learn the guitar in the cemetery. So even that story just has this amazing imagery of these two Delta bluesmen playing blues, slide guitar, learning all these rhythms, writing these lyrics out in a cemetery. So in, in some way we can't get away from this mythological element of something possibly supernatural. Even when people tell that story, which, is, which makes a lot more sense, he went and learned guitar, uh, it still has this really interesting, creepy, fun vibe to it. Um, so outside of that, I'm gonna go through kind of what happened after he became really good. Well, he uh, recorded 29 songs and it was over the course of two sessions. Somehow he made it to Jackson, Mississippi and he went in to see uh, C.S. Spire, I believe is his name. He had a hardware store, but he was kind of a guy you would go talk to and he would connect you with people that were recording at the time, almost like he was kind of like a scout. He goes in and apparently they liked what he played and they sent him to San Antonio and he recorded uh, three days in no uh, November of 1936. He uh, did a good chunk of all the recordings we have in that time period. They said that he went in, he was really timid and shy. There were some other bands and musicians around and there is a legend 
attached to this as well. Of course, there has to be more legends. He uh, faced the corner and didn't want anyone to see what his hands were doing. Apparently, he felt uh, people would learn these riffs and guitar licks and styles that he had kind of perfected and created. And he was real self-conscious of that. Or he was just really shy. It's probably just that he was really shy. Um, so they do that session. There is some success. And he gets invited back for a second session. And they do this one in Dallas uh, on June 19th of 1937. So a total of 29 songs. And that is his work. Now at the time they were released as singles. And you hear them in a jukebox. He comes back to the Delta. And a couple of the songs, uh, they made it. You know, you could say he had made it to some extent. He became locally popular and famous because he was one of the Delta juke joint players that was in the jukebox. And that had to be really amazing. Unfortunately, he died in 1938. This is just a few months after he became locally successful and famous. Not only locally, but they were played all over the South and in the U.S. in different spots. Um, his death is of some controversy. Uh, there was no evidence or announcement or even proof of his death or anything until 30 years later when a musicologist from Old Miss or Mississippi State dug up his death certificate um, because John Hammond of Columbia was going to invite him to Carnegie Hall uh, to play this massive concert and found out he was dead and nobody knew it. His, his recordings were becoming popular and yeah, he was gone. John Loma, uh, Lomax comes back down in 41, also not knowing. And again, they find out Robert Johnson's dead. But, uh, you know, supposedly he was stabbed, shot. There's all kinds of rumors. Uh, but it turns out that the most logical thing with eyewitness accounts and even a confession of murder on record from musicologists was that he was playing a juke joint. Uh, some man's wife was very fond of Robert. The husband was very jealous, poisoned his whiskey. Three days later, he fell dead in a field and they kind of buried him as he laid. An interesting fact about Robert's death is he is a member of the 27 Club. These are all really influential, amazing musicians who died at the age of 27. So Robert died at 27. Brian Jones, founder of the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse. There's like way, way, way more. There was a confession of the death where uh, a lady basically connected a uh, musicologist with a person who confessed in writing to poisoning his whiskey. This was years and years later and they never charged him or anything. His story is bonkers. Um, you go from no talent to reappearing, being successful, and then when you're invited to Carnegie Hall to play in this venue and atmosphere of all these amazing blues and folk artists and this folk revival that's coming around the corner in the early 60s, he could have very well lived in New York and been a part of that like a lot of other people but he was gone. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 86. Uh, the United States Postal Service issued a stamp in 94. Rolling Stone ranked him as the fifth greatest guitarist of all time. That was 72 years after his recordings. So that's Robert Johnson, the most influential, I think it's safe to say, one of the most, if not the most influential American guitarist possibly ever when you weigh the circumstances and the history of it. 1961, King of the Delta Blues was issued. This is after they realize he's dead, how important these recordings are. They put him out and that record becomes the record that young Eric Clapton, Keith Richards, Dylan, they all heard that record. Uh, then in 1970, they put out part two of that, which had alternate takes. And there was a CD, a two CD set in the 90s after Eric Clapton and all these people had made him famous. And that CD sold like a bajillion copies. It's really astronomical how well it did. So go check out some of his work. And yeah, that's how a 61 revisited. Hope this was interesting. I want to read a quote from Bob Dylan out of his biography about this highway. Um, and I think, yeah, there's just so many interesting facets here, but this kind of wraps it up. 
This is the Bob Dylan who we give so much credit for all of his musical innovation and changing music and the way that we think about songs in America. He says, Highway 61, the main thoroughfare of the country blues begins about where I began. I always felt like I'd started on that Highway 61. I had always been on it and I couldn't go anywhere else. Even down to the deep Delta country, it was the same road, full of the same contradictions, the same one horse towns, the same spiritual ancestors. It was my place in the universe and I always felt like that highway was in my blood. So I think a lot of the classic rock gods and songwriters that we so look up to, um, they probably feel the same way about this. If you ever have a chance, come to the Delta, start in Memphis and go south. It's really, really fun. Have a wonderful morning or evening, whatever you're doing. And uh, yeah, bye bye. Thanks so much for watching this. I hope it was really valuable to you. Um, this experience for me was really powerful as a musician and as a person to dive into this history of true American folk music, the Delta Blues. Um, there were some resources that were really helpful for me, so I wanna share those with you. First is an amazing book by Elijah Wald called Escaping the Delta. There's a picture of it there. I cannot recommend this book enough. You should buy five of them and give four away to friends. Read one, get a highlighter and a pen. Mine is just torn to pieces. I've read it twice. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing book. And a lot of what you saw in this video was me processing that out loud. And then there are three records that are really important. There's a lot of records you could listen to, but these were the three that hooked me. Um, there are Robert Johnson, volume one and two. Uh, basically, as you heard in this video, Robert Johnson is quite an anomaly. And then there is King of the Delta Blue Singers, which is a compilation. A lot of the same songs are on here and it's kind of some of the same things in different ways, but just get a hold of a Robert Johnson record. Listen to it, appreciate it. Put yourself in the era. Don't listen to it from 2021. It does you no good. Listen to it for what it was at the time and understand that everything we love was some way translated out of this over time. Really cool. If you like this, hit like. Subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon to get notifications of future episodes. There are some links in the description below for a band lab account where you can go over and join us musically from some of the things we do in other episodes. There's also the Patreon where this video originally came from. We have rebooted that and we're looking for people to help support the cause of videos like this and previous biographies that you've seen on the channel. And there's djhsshow.com. Uh, that's it. Have a wonderful day and uh, listen to some Robert Johnson. <laughs>